it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And we're extremely you know, excited to uh, launch this second academy camp. My name is Mercedes Giovinazzo, and I am the uh, director of Intrarts. We're based in Barcelona, and we are one of the four partners of the Capacity Building for European Capitals of Culture project. This project was launched late 2019 and will run well into 2022 by the European Commission with the aim of supporting capacity building and peer learning for European capitals of culture. So thank you very much for having me here. This is how we plan to do an evaluation from a university perspective, okay? So evaluation methods and what we plan to do in the cultural capital of culture 2025 in Chemnitz. And we are the university, the local university, so it's quite obvious that we are a part of the evaluation process. So. Uh, only some slides what we are planning, more classic methods and some digital methods as well. So now I can, okay, I press the button. So first the methods to monitor cabinets. And yes, there is the, the, the classic methods, you know, doing surveys and uh, in best case, close to representative surveys. So probability samples from official register data, and we are planning two types of uh, surveys. And this is the cabinets monitor, we call it. Let's do it with the laser pointer, mixed mode. So we try to do it offline for most people with internet connection to that it's not so expensive, but we also um, make surveys with people who are not able to do the online uh, survey. And this is every year, we are planning to ask a representative sample from Chemnitz how they feel, uh, how they, I mean, in general, how they feel, their attitudes to, towards Europe and a lot of different topics, environment, um, health, quality of life. And yes, of course, uh, a lot of questions about what, how do they perceive uh, the cultural capital, uh, what they expect what they don't like, what they like. Yeah, so at the beginning, what they expect, and at the end of the whole process in the next years, what they thought, what happened, and what happened. Okay, a lot of questions about Chemnitz, the Kulturhauptstadt, and the Saxony panel. So we are going also, let's say, in the social context in Saxony. So we've got two big cities, uh, Leipzig and Dresden, and they are very big in culture. And yes, uh, Chemnitz tries to come yeah, and comes closer to uh, what happens and, and understanding the image of Leipzig and Dresden. So we also look at the whole Saxony uh, and then again, a representative sample from Saxony, how the others perceive Chemnitz. And we are doing this in a, we call this quasi experimental design. We have a pre-test, post-test design. This means in advance of the Chemnitz yeah, Kulturhauptstadt. So the pre-test before it happens and then after it happened, post-test. And we make city comparisons. So let's say uh, the difference between the change of attitudes and perceptions, expectations from the Chemnitz um, citizens, citizens compared to, uh, let's say, Leipzig uh, and Dresden and other cities. So we have got this quasi experimental design, but we also at in the year 2025, of course, we are doing surveys on location, offline, online, try to make a lot of funny gamification, interactive tools. And let's see, we don't know what, what we all can implement, but there's a thousands of ideas, survey apps. I mean, we have got a lot of possibilities since we have got the smartphones and you know we try to use them is especially in the year 2025 and yes the creative artists the institutions maybe you call this the makers we also should uh, so should do service with makers so web service but also um, qualitative expert interviews and now okay this is the academy topic the digital top topics so the digital methods web scraping and, uh, and other methods. So web scraping means you, you scrap the data out of the internet. 
the data ne was never supposed to be part of an evaluation. It's what people write down in Twitter, what they write down in blogs, what they uh, yeah, how what they communicate in in and I mean kind of unlimited possibilities of chat rooms and Facebook and so on. Yeah, and these are non-reactive data because the people who write down something in a tweet they do not react uh, that in the sense that uh, oh now I am part of an evaluation show, so I should be uh, should should pay attention to social desirability. The people do not react to our measurement because they do not know that we are doing uh, analysis about these texts. So it's it's the pure uh, yeah so as I say uh, the the pure opinions attitudes of people. They just articulate this on Twitter and we can scrape this and make a big data set, a digital data set and from social media and yes, from the classic media as well. And we will look at this also. So look uh, on the right side, we have got the evaluation, the, the core, maybe if I take this, the core evaluation is, I mean, this, this all is evaluation here, yeah? So. And then we have got the Chemnitz monitor. This was this year, the classic service and the Saxony panel. I will shortly talk about what's the difference between um, this is a cross section survey and this is a panel. So panel means uh, it's always the same people being asked in the next years. And there's a big advantage of doing this uh, if you ask the same people. And here the core maybe is all the other things we are doing as well. So here, okay. So this is what we plan. The Saxony panel is planned in cooperation with the two other big universities in Saxony. So Technical University Dresden and University of Leipzig, the colleagues from there. So look at, I mean, the, here, this is the time axis. Okay. And we have got media data, we can scrape them. If we want to on daily level, if it comes close to the Chemnitz University, uh, Chemnitz University, to the Chemnitz cultural capital, yeah, um, I, then, I mean, then it, we can do this even daily. Maybe it's too much data if we start now, yeah, but um, we can do this afterwards with, with web scraping um, techniques and we can look at what, how media react on this and how the social media, so the people, the people, okay, here, here are the people, <laughs> yeah, and so what they write down on Twitter and so on, and this is so-called social, socio-political context, which has, so, so we want to uh, analyze this, whether it has an impact on what in the trend and panel data happens, and this is the Chemnitz monitor, so every year, a new sample, a new representative sample, and the Saxony panel waves is several thousand people will be asked uh, repeatedly over the, the next years. So this is the Chemnitz monitor here, and I mean now we plan it for every year, and you know here, I'm sorry for a bit too much painting here, I delete it. Yeah, this is the big year, okay, the 2025 for Chemnitz. And these are the pre-tests and these are the post-tests. Okay, and this is uh, why we're doing this. So we want to we want to know, let's say the attitudes towards, let's say, for example, towards Europe, they are stable and then probably they rise, but would they go they down then or do they stay there? So these are questions we can ask here. Yeah? Um, so, but this is, Always a new sample, but with panel data, we can look at within each person where they changed their mind. And this is a more complex method, but it's uh, also more complex that people repeatedly um, yeah, participate again and again. You have got a lot of problems with attrition that people uh, do, do, yeah, do skip to be, to be part of the panel, and then you have to take new samples and all these techniques from panel data. So, but this is the Saxon, the Saxony uh, context, and this is inside Chemnitz. And now one important thing, at least, is uh, the last point, very important, Chemnitz is also for sure. So citizens from Chemnitz will be also in the 
in this panel data, okay? So here in the panel data, we cannot ask thousands of questions about very, uh, let's say, on detail about candidates. This is more the outside perspective, also more general perspectives on the Kulturhauptstadt and, and in the special Chemnitz monitor, we can ask much more in detail the people living in Chemnitz. That's the plan. So now let's see. Um, Anne Kurzweg, when, when do we start? Let's see. Yeah, <laughs> I made this. Uh, that, that's now the question uh, we are planning and having a lot of discussions about this. But it would be good to start uh, very early because the the you said this uh, before the makers are already planning activities for next year so if we want to have the raw yeah the the completely uh, the data without any intervention you, we should do this baseline uh, data we can call this the very first pretest data as soon as possible so research designs very short why are we doing this so you know uh, the best uh, best way to evaluate an ev uh, intervention this year. It could be a medicine, so that's the pill, and this is the placebo group, okay? But this could also be the new, uh, yeah, uh, the, a new law, for example, and then you have got the pre-test, post-test, and you, but now um, this will be the Chemnitz cultural uh, capital, yeah? Uh, so this will be the Chemnitz, Chemnitz is the treatment, and now we look at whether, let's say the attitudes towards Europe, they are a bit low, and then in this group, they are increasing, and in the control group, there is no intervention, you see, no, there it should be sta stable, okay, what's that? Sometimes this happens with my pen, so you see it, and then you have got a wonderful evaluation, oh my god, the treatment worked. And one of the key things in experimental design is randomization. Let's say you've got 10 people and five become the placebo and five will be becoming the medicine, but it's random, randomly assigned to placebo or treatment. But here in Chemnitz, in this case, we cannot make randomly assigned to you are living in Chemnitz and you are living in Leipzig. So this cannot be randomly, and this is what we call, uh, so we have got the within effects and the between effects. And uh, this call is why we call it quasi-experiment. We have no comparison, no randomization, and this is not a very a super valid comparison. So this means we need some statistics. So yeah, it could be that uh, the pro-European people are already living in Leipzig and not so much in in Chemnitz, and then you think uh, that you think the inter intervention didn't work or it worked, but it was from the beginning on, and you had no randomization. And this is why in statistics, we call this lower validity. And this is, for example, why we are using propensity score matching and other methods. In short, we are searching for statistical twins. This means if I go back, you are not just doing here with 1,000 Chemnitz people and 1,000 uh, Leipzig people, but you are searching twins which are uh, as yeah, close to each other in hundreds of characteristics uh, as possible. So you are searching for twins and you are analyzing only the twins, the statistical twins. And so this is then uh, at least a quasi experimental design. And you can have much more. Uh, um, higher validity, let's say, in this case, uh, for causal inference, this means that the, uh, really the Chemnitz uh, cultural capital had the effect that this was the effect. So you need the control group. And this is the quasi experiment, you see non-random, so we cannot randomly assign people to living in Chemnitz or Leipzig, that's clear. And in, this, in the Chemnitz monitor, you are all, every year we are having a new sample so this is also not the same people. This is why there's this gap. This is how we uh, how we treat this so in, in our figures that you see it's not the same people. And then you have got a, yeah, uh, you can still compare the before and the after observations. So the attitude towards Europe here and here, uh, but it's not the same people. So the validity is a little bit lower, but still it's good that you have got pre-test, post-test. 
And we have got other cities, and this comes from the Saxony panel, and then there is not the treatment. You can also look at whether uh, living closer to Chemnitz or more, uh, yeah, more away from this, for example, in Dresden and Leipzig, whether there is more or less effect. So this is why we, we need the Chemnitz monitor and the Saxony panel. And if you want to, or if we want to have uh, also uh, analysis of the same people in the pre-test and in the post-test, then you all, uh, only can use the panel data. And then it's the same people. That's a little bit more validity. It's still both are good, but th this would be a bit higher validity, but still in the Saxony panel, we cannot ask all the thousand questions about in detail. This is why we also always need the Chemnitz monitor as well. Digital methods, uh, very short, you see, let me introduce this in a broader sense. This is uh, reactivity. That's the measurement. So if I'm doing a survey with you, you react to this because you know that you are now part of uh, an evaluation or a survey. So you don't tell me, probably, that you are against foreigners because of social desirability. And so the measurement itself can uh, influence or bias, so to say, the measurement results. And the digital methods, are, uh, they have got a lot of hope in these methods that there is not so much social desirability. We call this, you see, uh, and the, all these non-reactive methods, they are 30, 50 years old. This means the traces and footprints of people in the physical world, this was already uh, um, evaluated and analyzed a lot of years ago, 30, 40 years ago. So you can look at in the museum, uh, which object is uh, do the kids like most. And you see this physically, the footprint, where you see all the nose, nose taps yeah, on, on, the, uh, on the objects or on the glass in front of the objects. And then you see the, this was uh, the, uh, the kids like this object most. So the physical footprints we leave in the world, not just surveys. And we leave thousands of footprints, and yes, we leave them in the web very, very much. So you can you can do this digital methods now. I've got the next slide. You see the digital footprints, and this is uh, what we scrape. We scrape this from the internet. You have got uh, also from Twitter and other um, uh, social media platforms. There's also um, yeah, nice apps you can use them to look uh, and analyze and scrape all the Twitter. But you can also do it with topic modeling. This means that you've got a computer program which half automatically uh, analyzes all the thousands of Twitters. Let's call it big data. I don't know. Big data, maybe it's a, word, a bit too much. In my sense of big data, we are living in a world we don't have got the big data at the moment, but it increases. But it will be much more bigger and really big data in maybe 10, 20, 30 years. I think we cannot imagine what data in 30 years will be available. But we look at this media data and social media data with web scraping. We also call this para data, and that's interesting. While a classic survey, I can for example, collect the reaction time. So I'm asking you a question and then I can, um, can monitor how long did it take that you answer and the time means something. For example, the faster you are, that the more strong is your attitude here down there. So if you are very sure I'm against blah, 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 and you need only 100 milliseconds, this means that's a really strong attitude and we can do this as well. So a lot of possibilities, and it's just the beginning. Let me say something about web scraping of tweets. This is from this uh, web, website. We didn't want to show you examples from our work because it would be maybe too complex. You see, very, very simple. Let's have a look at the hashtag Canada, and you see the most, yeah, uh, most often used word is Canada. Okay. Um, but you can also have question which terms are associated with 
Kultur Hauptstadt Chemnitz. And then it's interesting. I, I have no idea why Alberta is the third most often used word. Maybe a Canadian could tell me this. But I mean, it tells you something that what is, which are the terms most often used and which are associated. But this is only the first step. Then you can look at are these negative or post positive words. So the valence, the valence of these tweets, we call this sentiment analysis. So you can have, let's have a look at Canada. You see, cold is one of the most, the most often word, used words, uh, negative and positive love. And then Trump, you can say, what, Trump, positive? But yes, uh, these are the tweets compared to Trump. Canada is much better, you know? So this is why Trump is uh, the second most often word used, the positive used word. Uh, when it comes to Canada, but this is also just the beginning. Now we can do here contingency analysis. This means which terms are associated always when the term cultural uh, uh, capital Chemnitz is used, then there's this and this positive word and always the other negative word. So you can have the connections between them. So what is associated, associated with which term? So you can have the interactions between them and um, the correlates, uh, what, what ha happens between these words. And you can have more and more sense of what the people think about the cultural capital. And is it stable over time here? The last point here. And then we can have our, our nice statistical methods. And yes, that's the scientific part, you know. We have got the context data here, the social media data, negative and positive, and the media data. And here are, on the right side, are all the questions we ask in our surveys. The individual beliefs. So what do people believe? What is good for the artists? Is it good for the city? Is it good for the population? Is Chemnitz Kulturhauptstadt good for you and so on. Yeah. And at the end, we want to explain the attitude and the acceptance of the Kulturhauptstadt at the end. And we are searching for predictors for um, conditions under which condition do the people like it and under which not. And for sure, here are all the control variables and subcultures, gender, age, and, 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 and. So just to add that you have got an idea what we are planning to do. One last slide about open science. We had a conference a few weeks ago, more than 200 participants from all, all, all over the world. Open science is a big, big change, probably in all sciences and the culture of science. The culture of science is much more transparency, replicability, much more collaboration than ever before. And this is what we really have to do. Open access to results. What did you do? How did you do this? Not just uh, writing this in your publication in a footnote, we did this, this, and this, and uh, two lines. That's not enough. I cannot replicate it with two lines. Give me your code. Give me the whole statistical code. I know it's 200 pages long, but give it to me. Give me the data. And in publishing is pre-registration. This means uh, you have to say in advance before the study, what are your hypotheses? And then you are starting with data collection. And again, publish all, all uh, scientific publications should include statistical codes and access to the data. Crowdsourcing, doing the analysis with hundreds of others simultaneously and all the big data, uh, collaborative networks, data networks, analysis networks, and they are rising and rising. And we are kind of uh, replicating each other during the process. And I really hope that we can introduce a lot of, uh, implement, sorry, a lot of uh, ideas from Open Science to the Kulturhauptstadt evaluation. And I will try to do the best that we can have the most accessible what is possible. What is possible, we do try to do it, make it accessible. So thank you very thank much. You. Yeah.
my name is Rossella Tarantino and I, I am a sort of a geological example of Matera 2019 since uh, I've been working on this project uh, in 2010. So we, we, we took uh, four years in order to, to present the bid, the, the bid book that we won. Uh, there was a competition of 22 cities uh, for this title. I think it was the, 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 the most crowded competition in history of the European capitals of culture. So four years to build the dream and uh, four years to uh, implement it. And now um, after 2019, we worked on the um, collection and uh, of all the data and the evaluation studies, and of course, on the implementation of the open data uh, platform. Um, uh, yes, the Matera 2019 invested since the beginning on open data. Um, in, uh, also during the bidding phase, we had a very strong uh, connection with the, the, the municipality and we urged them to, uh, to use the open data. Um, and we organized together, we launched together a, a call, uh, in order, which was a, a address to, to artists, to creative people in, uh, in, uh, in broader terms, in order to use uh, these, uh, these data uh, as a creative uh, uh, product. And uh, one of these, uh, of the winners of this, of, of this uh, call was uh, Ego Cinquanta Cinque, it was a, a an association from Matera, a company, a company from Matera, who uh, developed these uh, Matera events uh, tool, which was one of our database that we use to collect data. I show you uh, briefly uh, this one. Yes, did you see it? Okay, and um, it was uh, a way to, uh, it was very interesting because uh, every, uh, all the producers uh, can uh, add information about the events. And uh, so we had all the information about, uh, it, it, so it was at the same time uh, a tool to, to communicate was also a, a tool to uh, collect data about uh, the, every single event. And so you can have uh, uh, information. So it, it was very interesting because it was a widespread um, method, a widespread of the um, of the of the of this uh, of, of this platform, and everyone, every producer can insert their um, their data. So. A lot of, of, uh, of people uh, feed uh, the, this, uh, this, uh, this platform. And this is extremely important because the collection of data is extremely uh, um, expensive in terms of, uh, of time, in terms, in terms also of, uh, of the quality of information. So this was one of our database, which was interesting. It was also important in order to, uh, you can have information about categories, you can have information about format, about data, about location, about people, about uh, the people who can, uh, uh, take part in these, in these events. So it was a really very, very rich uh, database, which was very useful for us. It was, and all the data were, uh, of course, uh, uh, open. Um, then we, uh, we had another important data database uh, was the, uh, this uh, Venus Matera 2019. It was uh, uh, realized by the Open Design School the Open Design School is one of the pillar projects of Matea 2019. It is our legacy project. It is uh, uh, now is, is considered one of the prototype of the new Bauhaus. And it is, uh, it is very difficult to explain. Uh, Open Design School is not a school, first of all. It is a sort of a center of uh, design, prototype, and the production of, the, um, of all the setup for Matera 2019, but not, not only. And one of the uh, very interesting um, 
deliverables of the Open Design School was these uh, venues of Matera 2019. There was this group made of uh, people from uh, one third from the world, or one third from Italy, one third from, from, uh, from the south of Italy, uh, that uh, mapped all over um, the, the region the possible venues of, of, uh, of for Matera 2019. So all the public spaces which were um, in some cases abandoned, which were not used and which could be used for 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 the program but which could be used for any other thing and uh, um, and this uh, in of course, the uh, uh, the team was uh, uh, made of different uh, professionals. So we have a cartographer from Brazil. Uh, we have a, a, a software engineer from Germany. Uh, we have an archi two architects from Matera and one from uh, uh, from Milan, and so on. So it was a very interesting uh, interdisciplinary team, and uh, this was one of our um, database for 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 uh, for. Um, uh, for the open data. And uh, another one was uh, made by uh, our um, passport data. So in Matera, we invented this uh, passport. So you, we didn't sell tickets to take part for to the, to the events, but we, we uh, conceived a passport uh, which, which can uh, give access to all the events uh, organized material. So all the big events, very expensive events, also or very uh, small scale events. And you can buy um, this passport and it, it costed 19 euros for, uh, for tourists for temporary citizens and 12 euros for um, permanent citizens and uh, and you can have access to everything and you can also uh, um, have a free uh, public transport uh, so we have a lot of data about the um, about the anagraphic of people who bought this passport, but we have some bias, and this is one of the tips that I would like also to give you because we uh, didn't design together with the the people uh, with the people who took part who conceived this part passport uh, the, the 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 monitoring system, and so we didn't have very good data about uh, about this uh, database and um, and so uh, uh, we 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 called uh, Matteo from Sheldon because uh, we uh, would like also to um, use the, the these all these open data all this data um, in a different way so we conceived that the, the open data like a digital commons, uh, like a digital uh, um, uh, common good, uh, which was not to be uh, addressed only, let me, uh, to nerd uh, people. It is, it is uh, open data, it, it was important for us, not just for accountability, which is extremely important, of course, not only for the data, the data for the uh, open data for the open data, uh, but it is extremely important also uh, because you have to, um, because, because they can empower other people, can generate new uh, knowledge, uh, as a professor from Chemnitz, um, uh, underlined before it was it is extremely important because it is a generative process so it, this is what's important it is extremely important also to enlarge the people who can uh, uh, have access and uh, can use this data that's why we worked with Matteo because they um, their team is made of data journalists it, data analyst, and it, it is extremely important that uh, these data that we published are used also by scholars, by 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 journalists, uh, by um, uh, of course by by designers, by artists, and by students. And this is was also our challenge: how students, for instance, can use open data and can have their um, Evaluation of Matera 2019 under their point of view using this data. So it, 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 this is our our challenge, and it is extremely important because 
you can have a dynamic and interactive visualization of what was data produced through the data. And um, for instance, it's here you can have uh, not only you can know everything about uh, the articles which were published on the on the media, but you can all have also access to the single uh, article. So you can download, for for instance, the article which were published in the uh, newspapers uh, of the United States. So it is extremely a sort of of mining and uh, is extremely important. My name is Matteo. I am a designer, a former academic researcher in design, hopefully a future professor, and obviously the co-founder of Sheldon Studio. So the studio uh, we founded one year ago, uh, and then through the studio, we designed the open data portal of Matera. And the title for today is Let's Open the Open Data. As anticipated by Rossella, we, we think it's very important to turn open data into a real common because we know open data are very important to, to build and yes, to, to build new knowledge and new, new forms of information and discovery. But we think the biggest problem of open data is that up to now are all are manageable, manageable only by those people that already know how to manage open data, not the classical average citizens. So what we tried to do was to reduce the distance between the average citizens and the open data, how through the design. So let me proceed in my presentation. First of all, yes, what we do. As Sheldon Studio, we work on the intersection between visual journalism that it's a form of interactive journalism that relies also on multimedia and interactive um, visualization and so on. Information design, also known better as infographics and social design. So this part of design that deals with social issues and obviously the digital part of social design. And what we do with all these three main disciplines, we try to design informative experiences. This is the homepage of our website where we, since the beginning, states this, let's say, new concept. What is exactly an informative experience? So very quickly, on one side, we have the information. On the other side, we have experience. And just to make a very quick distinction, information is usually indirect. So we read information we watch, we listen to information is always something that is pro produced by other people and that we consume. On the contrary, experience is something that we live in the first person. So it passes through our bodies and very important, we always share a memory, almost always, of uh, the experience we just live. Could be bad or good memories. So with information experience, we refer to those form of design that tend to reduce the distance between information and experience. So trying to let the readers in a way experience what the information is driving. The main goal is to enable a broader audience to understand that social and political issues are complex issues. Obviously it's impossible to explain the complexity, especially with a, a website, but at least it will be great if people, the majority of the, and the people would at least get the idea that when we talk about social things, we talk about complex things. So it's not very easy to get a clear position, especially on a complex topic. Because yes, reality is more complex than it is advertised. And is important for, uh, now it's, I have very short time to explain, but I think it's very important let the people get this because even in the media in the last years, always reality is represented between two factions, black and white. So in the end, our dream is to activate citizens through our project and support a better informed communities toward a more aware society. But yes, how? Uh, Rossella really showed the, the website. I try to condense all the website, the open data portal in a few seconds, but obviously you can also watch it online Otherwise, you can also read the case study we publish on Medium. It's very interesting, not, I'm, I'm not advertising, but 
because the case study explained how we use data storytelling, so narratives, to, let's say, innovate in a, the, the concept of open data portal, because open data portal usually are just a repository of data set. So in the, instead, we approach the design of the open data portal with, as I said, with the data storytelling and social design perspective. So turning the traditional portal in, uh, in something that unveils to a broader audience the power of the open data. So we showing what the material open data, what we can do with material open data. And yes, in stop trying to inspire the citizens. In a few words, a sort of meta open data portal. And what we learn through, through this design? For sure that designers may have a crucial role in making further sense of open data. So turning open data as a real digital commons with the aim to break the insider bubble, make open data really accessible to a broader audience, and obviously to raise data literacy among non-expert audiences, and also supporting the design of new forms of awareness and also of information production by non-experts. So empowering citizens to produce their own form of information. Obviously, we also try to foster a greater civic awareness on the importance of open data, because uh, at least in Italy, we lack uh, some, uh, we lack the, the open data culture. So once people understand the value that open data have, is uh, then are more, uh, to say, uh, familiar with the, with, the, with the issues that are connected to the data and the importance of the, um, the, the, the struggle that the open data movement every day um, bring. But then what if we could move back in time? So what could be, uh, be done better? First of all, uh, I would suggest to rely on collaborative design approach involving not only the designer, but also all the stakeholders since the beginning of the project. Uh, this would foster a, a better process to envision the interplay between the open data the, and the people and all the other things that are connected to them before, during, and after the event. What I mean? Uh, we, to, thanks to Rosella, we had the occasion to, in a way, open a new uh, door. So turning open data also in something more than just a series of number. But this happened until the end of the year of the capital. So we just worked on, on the data we, we, we had. Uh, in, a, in a more what if situation, would, would be great being involved even before so to design together what we are going to expect, what are the interaction we, we dream or desire, and according to our vision, then start designing something toward, um, toward it. Another useful thing, I think, is relying more on transmedia storytelling strategies to bridge the digital and the physical world and vice versa. What is transmedia? Transmedia refers to all these kind of narration that are happening not only in the same place, but are distributed uh, in different places. For instance, multimedia means different medias like video, sound, and whatever rely in the same place, in the same, for instance, page. With transmedia means that the same phenomenon is told a part on digital, a part in the streets, another part on mobile phone, another part, I don't know, in other places. So this to foster from one side, the, the readers or the users are in a way are um, pushed to reach and collect all the other pieces of the story over other digital platforms or physical platforms. And the second important thing is that it opens the same story to different audiences. For instance, elder people are not very familiar with the digital tools, so probably they get this, the part of the story in the park or in the streets, while young people are more used to, to mobile and read another part. So it's a sort of, it's called transmedia. And, and also this would allow to connect people do, even during the events, so with real-time data that the people feel part of the, the capital. 
So for instance, this is, the, this is the traditional approach where we have people that are parts of the events that take place in places and then the open data portal that are different things that belongs to separated layers. With the transmedia approach, the idea is to, in a way, blend the thing together. So connect everything through different kinds of, for instance, data. Um, there is, for instance, the example of Peter Ornolf that created uh, urban data visualization using urban objects or Jose Duarte that used the, the data visualization sticking in the wall of the street to, to raise awareness among the citizen. Or Dietmar, I don't know, it's, it's a super German professor and designer. It's called Dietmar Offenuber. Now he's teaching in the Northeastern in Boston. He made an incredible project in Frankfurt about pollution using the, 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 the technique is called reverse graffiti, basically uh, removing the, the the first layer of pollution over the buildings. So showing the real color and through the, by contrast, showing also the amount of pollution every building have in that place. And very important now, probably is not very visible from the picture. There is a QR code that you can scan in order to connect, get connected to the real digital data. So bridging the physical and the digital. This is what I mean with transmedia. Or the project made by Pau and by the domestic data streamer. This is very nice. It's a guy that is collecting real-time data during a live event. So if you give five to this guy, or uh, according to the right hand or the left hand, you decide which kind of data you would like to increase. Or finally, the participatory data physicalization we did some year ago with people. So are different kinds of ways to engage citizens with data that belongs to them, first of all, that happen in the physical world, but then could be also replicated in digital and vice versa. Finally, thinking and framing the open data portal as a strategical communication asset. So making in a way, not profit in terms of economical um, point of view, but using as a real uh, tool to promote, to position, to communicate, to inform daily during all the events in synergy with social media and press managers. I'm Pau Garcia. I'm, I work both in the university. I'm director of the Master in Data and Design here in Barcelona um, of Pompeu Fabra and Lisaba. And also I, I'm the director of the studio Domestic Data Streamers that for the last seven years we have been um, exploring what, what we could do to bring data experiences into the physical realm. And today I, I tried to make a, a short version of, of possibilities, right? So it's, it's not such a, like a lecture or anything, but I just wanted you to bring possibilities, things that you could do at some point. And, and like our, our experiments has, has, has happened all over the place, like from schools to hospitals to even churches, um, like gardens during the day, during the night, in, in obviously museums. And, and always we try to explain what is data and, 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 and explain it in a human way and, and, and understanding that is a two-way direction, that is not only about a data monologue, about explaining information, but it is about also listening what people have to say about this data. And, and whenever like, you want to understand like, the perception of data, you just have to write data on Google Images. This is like how the world understand information, right? Like this kind of blue matrix, like these random numbers. And, and, and this is a perception that we have to address somehow when we want to make people participate of information and, and give their own information that for them, data is just like this very random stuff. And at the very end, it's much more than this. And we know this whenever we see uh, things like the cost of corruption in Europe up to 990 billion lost annually, like our brains are not wired to understand these numbers or these figures. And this like really disconnects people from the information that we are like trying to convey and explain sometimes. And the same happens in a much bigger scale whenever we talk um, and use these numbers, these huge numbers to talk about people, right? Um, so like we always explain that our fight is uh, against not standardized ways to explain information, but 
um, against this lack of empathy that we are creating today with a with standard surveys, for example, right? And and this lack of empathy is the thing that you do whenever like you see I don't know uh, a news saying, well, there are 300 deaths in the Mediterranean Sea, like 300 refugees found dead, and you see that news again and again and again, year after year, and then you become just I don't know, like you don't care, like you stop caring about these things, and and this is a, a something that is horrible by itself, but uh, what brings with it is even more complex that is uh, not only a lack of empathy, but a lack of action. If I don't care about something, why I should do something to change it, right? So whenever we talk about data and information, uh, we, we express it in the same way the, the idea of bringing emotions to it and bringing experiences to it, because then people will start caring and will improve and create movement towards a, a specific action, right? So data by itself is not important, is what comes with it and is the possibilities that can bring to the table. And this is like the most important part of any data project that sometimes we are just collecting data, 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 and it's not about the data, it's about what we will do afterwards with it, right? Which are like the main hypotheses and which are like the final goals and the final movements that we want to do afterwards, right? Um, so on that direction, I always talk about like this different path. Like there are like standardized data systems that are like always very like personalized and we have all these hypotheses in how to work. And there is like this data participation that is how the people really want to express themselves and how the people really want to like go through their way, right? And I think there is a very important like difference between these two. And, and it's like uh, this idea that normally we, like the people that are organizing information and data and creating research methods, uh, we know um, how to do it. And, and there are a lot of moments that we really have to open spaces within our research um, to also hear what, how people will like to express themselves and not only like create like the, the, the standardized systems. Right? And, and, and this is an example that I really love and it's very simple and, and, but it's very useful as a metaphor. This is the Michigan State University and, and they build like the whole campus, all the buildings, and, and, but they didn't build any road between them. Like they just plant some grass and wait for a year so the people will walk through the place and then they will see and they will just like create this path properly, right? But they will wait until the students and, and the people living in the campus will create like their more natural path to it. And I think uh, participation on data has a lot to say on like these kind of things, because whenever you open a new space, more explorative or experimental, people also can hack it, can use it in ways that you, you don't think that they can be used, right? So permeability um, and openness in the way we collect information is also important. Um, so on that direction, I will show you like uh, 10 different examples or 12 that uh, are, are by system. These data strings is something that Matteo have used also, and it's a very simple way. And, and it's something that we have done all over the world and it have always worked. And it's a kind of a survey where you will have all the options, all the potential options on the wall and you will string knit your own profile on the wall, right? This is crazy because we have done it in Hong Kong, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have done like obviously all over Europe and, and in the States and South America. And every time we, we don't have to explain anything. Like the people really need it in a way that is really interesting. And I, I, I remember this moment um, hearing this. Let me let me show you something that happened. Um, this was in 2013 and, and we didn't contemplate other genders than male or female. It was obviously an error from our side. But what happened is that because this was an open system, someone decided with this string that he will not like go through any of this, right? And, and I think like having this, like these possibilities within the systems are also new ways of collecting information, right? Um, other than this, we, we, uh, a few years ago, we created Elena, that is a system um, that um, is used to collect information on the audiences on, on conferences, right? And uh, what we did was on the conference, we bring like a small paper with two uh, filter papers. One was red and the other one was blue. 
And we ask the audience to take their uh, lanterns from the, from the phone and put red or blue um, filters upon the, 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 the place. And it was really amazing because you could do all kinds of experiments by itself. It was a, a very aesthetical and artistic experience. It was kind of a performatic way of the audience expressing themselves. And, and, and you could like ask whatever you wanted, like things like, um, how do you like the person that you have in your right? And you will see how everyone was like very uncomfortable at the beginning. And, and so you could make like this exercise to see like if the people was getting the, 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 the whole system. And so, and then afterwards we could also create, like we created these two balloons that were on the, on the next to the screen at that point. And, and depending on the amount of people that say red or blue, we had a camera there, a Kinect camera, counting all the dots and counting all the pixels with one color or the other. And then we were creating this live infographic with two balloons lighten up with two colors that will represent on real time this the information, right? So it, it, it was a kind of the thing that we have done before, but in a, in a, in a very like physical way, right? Um, uh, in another dimension, I, I think it's very important whenever we we create spaces of of dialogue, of conversation with the audience, we have to have very much uh, in mind the context in which this happens, right? And, and and the installation that I will show you happened in a very extreme space that um, is the 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 prison La Modelo in Barcelona. That is a very important um, prison symbolically here in Spain and in Catalonia because it was a prison where um, there was a lot of political prisoners uh, during the dictatorship, right? And it was still operating up until five years ago. And uh, one year after they closed the, the, the prison, um, they opened it for a urban art festival. And we were part of that. And we said, okay, this is the perfect space to actually create surveys about the idea of justice and morals. And let's ask things that kind of um, trump this idea of what is legal or what is not in, in that specific place, right? So that was more or less like the picture that I took when I got there. So there was still like all the traces from people living in there. And, and because we wanted to talk about justice, we created a system that metaphorically could also represent justice somehow, right? So we created these scales Right, that will have this major question, and then you will have like different stones in in a table, and you will pick one of the stones and bring it to one part of the scale, right? Creating like this kind of visualization, and and this is exactly what we did there, and it was like really really amazing to see the amount of discussion that people had in there because it was not about clicking something; it was about having a a, a very public opinion about something specific. And obviously that was creating bias, but it was creating a very critical discussion around this space about certain topics, right? That otherwise was would be impossible to have. And obviously it was, it was uh, very interesting to see like how there was like groups of people that were getting together to, to hear what other people were saying in front of these installations. And I think, um, this is one of the interesting parts of, has, of having physical spaces as, as a spaces of, coll of, of collecting information that it's not only a way of listening, but also a way of explaining to the people, right? So it acts as a kind of a mirror of everyone passing by this place. And it, it creates a lot of, of, of synergies and, and reactions towards this data that is not data that, okay, I'm giving you this information and you are not giving nothing back to me. It's about creating something that it really gives something back to the people that is participating and bringing their own data and opinion on that. Right. On another total different context and environment, we did a kind of a machine for the Laos Awards. These are like the Spanish Design Awards. And one of these awards is called the, the Audience Award. So this award is, is given by the amount of people that tweet a specific um, nominee of these awards. And so they, how they normally used to do that was hashtag, the name of the awards and the number of the nominee, right? And they had like very little participation and they said, okay, we have to do something because 
like we are only having like let's say 500 people participating this is a very important award so we need to increase the participation on that and we said okay so let's set up an installation at the design museum and 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 transform all this like virtual interaction that was already happening into something physical that the people can see and so we created like this machine that on real time will send all these tweets into this space, this kind of installation that will bring for each tweet a drop of liquid gold into a test tube. Each of the test tubes will have one number representing one of the nominees. So we were kind of splitting the award between like the proportion of people um, voting for them, right? And again, it was a, a metaphor of expressing like how the audience wants award word. But it was also a way of changing the word by itself because when the ceremony came, what we did was bring the, the specific proportion of gold and award to each of the, of the participants, right? And it was really interesting because uh, the people started coming to the museum to see how the votation was going, uh, but also they came back like weeks after to see if it, it, if it had evolved. And I think this is something very interesting about like data installations and physical spaces that they are alive they change and they are part like of the urban landscape in a way that is very, very much alive. And I think that that's like a new layer of, of ideas that, that can bring like a lot of um, like activity to a, a specific space, right? And going back to the, to, to the project that Matteo already uh, explained about us, uh, this was a project that a commercial project that we did for Bifeter and and Bibica Life and Mad Cool that are the two biggest uh, festivals in Spain, and and what we did was okay instead of making a great campaign of of Bifeter and and having your, having their logo all over the place and investing all the money in branding, let's invest the money in 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 spaces of use usefulness and also in, in spaces where we can hear what the what the festival goers want right uh, so what we first created was this application that was called the stand for your lineup and uh, and we were kind of uh, looking for like this space of already interaction that happens between festival goers and festivals and this was like the lineup which artists are going to come to this festival this is the first question you do before going to a place and we said okay um, neither of of these two festivals have this application let's create it with the money of Bifeter and, and we created this kind of tinder like application that was creating like these polarized options all the time and some of them were mu music like musical taste and, and and directly like groups of music and and you could actually say okay uh, i'm more of this group or this other uh, but we were like asking all kind of, of questions like you are the, the the kind of people that are in front in first row uh, or the ones that are in the back you are and, and we were asking things about like uh, people's behavior on this festival right and at the very end we had this um, visualization that was not only visualizing your lineup and the artists that were going to play but also the amount of people that th that thought as same as you that actually was corresponding to the amount of people that will be in the in the in that gig on the festival. So this information was even like not even the festivals had this kind of information. That that was really new for them. And that, that asked they asked us to visualize all this information on the big screens on the festival. So the the audience themselves could like kind of self-control and not go all to the same gig at the same time. And because we wanted to have like this um transmedia experience um, we also had like this this these physical installations following the idea of of, of the of the application uh, these polarized options where we will have like um these kind of doors using the using the, the the flux of people from one place to the other from one scene to the other and and instead of stopping them and asking them questions we were just saying okay they are gonna go from this place to this other place let's just bring some doors and they will go through this and and the questions themselves were not like really important like Gandalf or, or Dumbledore Leonardo da Vinci or Leonardo DiCaprio right that that was not the important thing the important thing was which of these topics are the ones that are creating more engagement on the on the people which are the the, the ideas and and the topics that brands and festivals have to speak to the people that are in festivals right and 
So this, this door was the, the one that had more success. It says, I'm looking for the love of tonight. Or I'm looking for the love of my, of my life. And, and you could see like 11 guys on the other side of the door, like just watching, like stopping to see like who was going in which direction. It was incredible to see like how it was actually changing the behavior of people on the, on the space. And we also created the data walkers following this, like the same system, the, the, the jetpack that some of the festivals use to sell beer through the place. We said, okay, let's do, use the same system. Let's camouflage within this context of festival to collect information, right? And, and do it in a, in a fun way. This obviously because COVID now is kind of a dream. It's impossible to, to think on interactions like this. But at that point was like really wonderful. We had over 30, uh, 37,000 interactions in three days. So like we, we had to give them like, um, how you call it, um, uh, milk, um, <laughs> hydratant cream to their hands because they were like super tired afterwards. And obviously we brought um, three anthropologists um, to, to Bilbao and three anthropologists to Madrid to have uh, other than quantitative information, qualitative information. So we will cross both and have interviews and observation. And from there, we created what we call uh, ebenography, that is like this data report in the spaces and the opportunities that are in festivals, both for brands and festivals, right? And it was a full research project that started as a communication campaign, right? It was just a communication campaign that was open to this conversation. At the same time, was collecting information, giving information, and at the very end, creating like this step of knowledge that both festivals could use and also obviously the brand. And because we wanted to make all this information open, we, we created this website that is called um, uh, Our Dear Festival Goers. We know you better than your mothers. And, <laughs> and it was like sharing all the information that we have collected in a more like fun way. And, and obviously the, uh, all the data was really open and everyone could mm, have used them, but we kind of created this very like, um, yeah, I don't know, festival goer, tone of voice to, to express the information itself, right? Um, and I, I don't know, Nicole, if I'm, I'm, I'm being... We, we, very, we have to move on to a question and answer very okay. soon, but if it's very quick... Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I will... <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> um, okay. okay, let me see what, what I show you. Okay, so for example, I will not show this, this, this project, this is a, a system that we created and we use in a lot of the exhibitions that we do now, that we understand exhibitions as a citizen lab experiences. And we have created these cards, like there are N NFT um, sensors. And whenever you pass by the space, you can vote through exhibitions about what do you think about specific topics, right? And at the very end, we, we create uh, experiences um, at the end of the exhibitions that we call agoras where you can see your own information, your own opinions, and confront your own opinions to the rest of the people, right? So we create like this data, very quick data visualization systems um, that, that visualize data. And obviously on digital is, is something very similar. One of the problems um, that we have sometimes when, when working with, with, with physical um, interactions is that the, the possibilities of voting are limited. Right. And as you have seen in some of the examples, we tend to polarize and, and there is no, sometimes not enough space to give opinion. Right. So uh, for those, we started thinking about how we can create open tech systems that could integrate more, more ways of, of creating uh, data and uh, entering data points. And, and this is one of the last installations we did that has been a, a success. And these are like 10 or 11 thermal printers. And, and you will get into this website. And you will be asked about well, feminism and feminist experiences, and, and the people will start like sending experiences around this specific topic. This was for a feminist exhibition, and and the old experiences will be printed. Every uh, thermal printer will be like kind of visualizing um, one one range of age, and then it will create like obviously all this kind of story and, and very experiential way. But the interesting part is that we started applying sentiment analysis and information and, and text tracking to all these 
um, information that we were getting. And we started localizing that most of the stories, for example, happened in school, in jobs, like in offices or in bars, right? And, and, and this was 70% of all the stories that were explained when we started kind of tracking the location of these stories. Right? And, and you can start like getting not directly from a survey like A, B or C, but from an open question, you can start like gathering information in a way that is interesting. My name's Steve Manthorpe. Um, I'm a project manager at the Cultural Institute of the University of Leeds. Um, I'm an artist uh, and have been a curator. Um, and uh, I have produced a number of digital um, interventions, uh, including projections, interactives, and so on. The subject of developing communities um, for a capital of culture is huge. Um, and in however many mi minutes I've got 15, I think, Nicole, there's no way that I'm going to be able to, to kind of uh, rationally cover any part of the territory, any significant part of the territory. Um, so I've plucked five flowers from the meadow. Uh, I'll just talk about five things. And the first one um, is, is addressed to, to um, Anna and her team. And it is, a, a, it is about creating communities of audience and participation. But I think it also applies to the capital of culture as a whole. And it's, you can't win, so don't waste your time trying. Um, if your approach is, I'm sorry, it's a long word and I can't think of a way of meaningfully reducing it. If your approach, your approach is predominantly, is mainly outward looking, um, you'll be accused of ignoring your, your core audiences, your core communities, especially your own creative community. If you focus on developing local capacity, you'll be accused of being, again, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't simplify the word, you'll be accused of being parochial, um, of, of being too locally focused and limited in your vision. I think the best you can hope for is to piss off roughly the same percentage in each camp. At least then you can claim balance. The second subject I want to address, and forgive me, this one is not predominantly about developing community, though it is about interaction and about reaching out. Um, so I've allowed myself to talk about it. Um, it's about commissioning. And I just wanted to share two of the most powerful, um, oh, of course, my phone. Hang on. It would go. Um, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> two of the most powerful um, digital interactive artworks I've seen. Um, both were in the Arts Electronica Festival in Linz in Austria. Um, and the second one of the two videos I'm going to show you, um, the second artwork was commissioned during that city's year as capital of culture. Um, the first artwork is Bump by uh, Roland Graff, who many of you will be aware of. Um, it was a, a telematic artwork very early from the noughties, um, which also traveled to a number of festivals and expos. Um, so I'm going to run a short video for that. I, I don't know if you gathered from the short clip, um, and but in bump comprised, it was two wooden platforms, two wooden walkways. Um, and as you walked along it, 
um, you sent a signal to the walkway in the other city. And so the where you were stepping, um, the planks in the other city would bump as if someone was walking on them. And likewise, um, the people in the second city who were walking or running on the walkway in Linz, you could feel um, you could feel them run past you and you could see uh, their steps going past you. And it was a very, particularly because it was an early um, telematic artwork, it was a very profound feeling of community um, with with that other city, with the people in that other city. The second artwork, um, and so um, Taxi Link is a booth. Um, uh, you sat in the booth and it was set up as if you were it sat in sitting in the back of a taxi in Jerusalem. Um, you could choose from one of six drivers of very different backgrounds, and they would take you wherever you wanted to go in the city of Jerusalem. Um, you could chat with them in real time. Um, if if you uh, if we can link to the to the videos, you'll see that one driver um, gets out of the cab and buys souvenirs on the request of passengers and so on. Um, and again, it, it was an incredibly engaging sense of the festival being bigger um, than the city in which it took place. Very powerful. Why do these projects work so effectively? I think because they use the speed of electronic communication to to extend the reach of the city in which it is installed to other cities, to other communities um, far away and in real time. Um, the third subject I wanted to address is a geolocation and augmented reality. And again, this, this may not seem to have a direct bearing on, uh, on developing creative communities. I think it does. Um, on a couple of days ago, June the 1st, I think, um, the World Wide Web Consortium published um, the latest geolocation API. For, for anyone who doesn't know that, uh, what ge geolocation it is, it's the it's the means by which data, and that could be um, written word, it could be moving image, it could be audio, um, anything that can be digitized, that can be flagged and located in a specific place. Um, allowing the history and, sorry, long word alert, um, psycho, psychogeography um, of places to be explored from mobile devices. Um, you may have seen it in its simplest form as um, the placing of QR codes in specific locations in order that people can click on the code and retrieve information. This is sometimes used in... in, um, in audio tours. Um, but I think by the time Chemnitz happens, I think we will be looking at the commercial rollout of um, the, the first serious commercial aug augmented reality devices. And I think there is a huge opportunity here um, for work, and this is where communities come in, um, for local artists with a profound understanding of Chemnitz, of its history, of its location, of its stories, of its diversity. Um, there's a great opportunity for small scale um, commissions to be geolocated across the city, to really bring the city to life for, for visitors to the capital of culture. My fourth topic is uh, I'm, I'm going to pass over the third vi video which was an example of, of geolocated commission that, that I commissioned but again I'll, I'll try and get a link in um, in the chat before the end of the day to that one. Um, creative labs I, I want to talk about now and by creative labs I mean those that are formally called creative labs, maker spaces, hack spaces, Fab Labs, um, there are almost as many names as there are organizations. Um, I recently was part of a group which did a study on creative labs, mainly in the north of England. We studied 80 different labs, um, but we also looked at some European um, labs, ones that we thought had important um, things to say about the nature of creative spaces. Um, and we came to the conclusion 
that like names, there are almost as many different models of creative communities as there are um, organizations themselves. Each one is defined more by possessing some of a group of characteristics we identified, but they're never the same set. So the creative labs we studied were, they were experimental. Um, they were co-creative. People chose to work together. And for that reason, they were interdisciplinary. People worked between disciplines and found meeting points between disciplines. They were socially engaged. Um, people were very, they were part of their communities and they wanted to express um, the issues that communities face and to celebrate um, the, the strength of, of communities. Um, they were limited in duration. That is, they, they, they ran projects which started, finished and ended. It, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a sort of ongoing program in that sense. Um, and another common um, element to Creative Labs, but, but not universal, um, was the use of producers who would facilitate and, and who, would, um, who would help communities to realize projects and would help to um, inspire communities um, to develop projects and to provide continuity in project management um, and to help to conform to the, the vision of the organization. Um, I think the an issue with working with your creative communities and I know in Chemnitz, are there four, three or four, I believe, um, that, would, that would be recognized as, as creative labs or mad labs or hack spaces. Um, I think one of the interesting things about working with these communities is that they are, by their nature, anti-authoritarian. Um, they do not want to be told what to do. And that is a consequence of the social engagement, activism, and the, sorry, long word, the individualism um, that drives people to create their own solutions and to realize their own visions rather than by somebody else's vision off the shop peg. Um, and this makes, this makes them, these organizations, impossible to push into activity they don't want to participate in but it makes them passionate advocates when your course and their course are in alignment in other words if you want to work with your creative communities if you want your com your creative communities to work with you you must work with them i think that's what i'm saying and my last, am I still running to time, Nicole? My last of my five flowers that I plucked almost at random um, is about 3D printing. Um, my, I, I don't know if you can see my 3D printer in the corner of the room. Is uh, I'm currently printing out a copy of the the Roman dodecahedron. And if you don't know what the Roman dodecahedron is, I suggest that you look for it because it's one of the most fascinating mysteries of European archeology. span But anyway, um, I wondered, I was, I was going to call a poll, but, but in the end I was too disorganized too. Um, I was going to ask how many people had access to a 3D printer or how many people could access a 3D printer if they wanted. And I, I was assuming, I think, that maybe a quarter to a third of our, of our quite geeky audience um, might possess a 3D printer. But I'm quite sure that almost everybody could access one through makerspaces, hackspaces, creative labs, if they wanted to. I think 
domestic 3D printers are a, a profound demo, uh, democratic tool. I think they will, they have not proven their worth they're, they're in their infancy. But I think in the fullness of time, um, they will be a fixture in, in every house, certainly in every farm or every small business um, where, you know, the ability to print out a washer for your tractor would be invaluable. Um, but my interest in terms of capital of culture um, is that I think it's another way to reach out to audiences, um, especially in conjunction with, with Fab Labs, makerspaces and so on. Um, obviously, the files, um, if anyone is unfamiliar with working with 3D printing, um, there are great libraries of files, um, Thingiverse, uh, Yegi, Pinshape, You Imagine, and um, Pirate Bay, um, the, uh, um, the BitTorrent aggregator. Um, they have a visible section of, uh, of 3D prints. And the reason I mention it is because I think you can reverse engineer merchandise um, for the capital of culture. And rather than having a, a model of marketing communications, because mer merchandise is essentially is a vehicle for marketing and communications, I think that you can flip that outwards so that it's no longer merchandise, but consumer dice. So that if, if you freely present commissioned work, um, branded items, and so on, if you make the STL files, the 3D printing files for these available to everyone, then I think you, you vastly increase the, the, the reach of those things. Now, that may be a reason not to go to Chemnitz, but I think it's much more likely to be something that will intrigue you and inspire you and really make you want to, to visit. Last of my five flowers that I plucked almost at random um, is about 3D printing. Um, my, I, I don't know if you can see my 3D printer in the corner of the room. Is uh, I'm currently printing out a copy of the the Roman dodecahedron. And if you don't know what the Roman dodecahedron is, I suggest that you look for it because it's one of the most fascinating mysteries of European archeology. span But anyway, um, I wondered, I was, I was going to call a poll, but, but in the end I was too disorganized to. Um, I was going to ask how many people had access to a 3D printer or how many people could access a 3D printer if they wanted. And I, I was assuming, I think, that maybe a quarter to a third of our, of our quite geeky audience um, might possess a 3D printer. But I'm quite sure that almost everybody could access one through makerspaces, hackspaces, creative labs, if they wanted to. I think domestic 3D printers are a, a profound Demo, uh, democratic tool. I think they will, they have not proven their worth they're, they're in their infancy. I think in the fullness of time, um, they will be a fixture in, in every house, certainly in every farm or every small business um, where, you know, the ability to print out a washer for your tractor would be invaluable. Um, but my interest in terms of capital of culture um, is that I think it's another way to reach out to audiences, um, especially in conjunction with, with Fab Labs, makerspaces, and so on. Um, obviously, the files, um, if anyone is unfamiliar with working with 3D printing, um, there are great libraries of files, um, Thingiverse, uh, Yegi, Pinshape, You Imagine, and um, Pirate Bay, um, the, uh, um, the BitTorrent aggregator, um, they have a visible section of, uh, of 3D prints. And the reason I mention it is because I think you can 
reverse engineer merchandise um, for the capital of culture. And rather than having a, a model of marketing communications, because mer merchandise is essentially is a vehicle for marketing and communications, I think that you can flip that outwards so that it's no longer merchandise, but consumer dice. So that if, if you freely present commissioned work, um, branded items and so on, if you make the STL files, the 3D printing files for these available to everyone, then I think you, you vastly increase the, the, the reach of those things. Now that may be a reason not to go to Chemnitz, but I think it's much more likely to be something that will intrigue you and inspire you and really make you want to, to visit. I'm Callum. I am a multidisciplinary creative practitioner. I have a background in anthropology and in speculative design. Um, but more concretely at the moment, my work has been involved in community building um, at a space called Trust, which I co-founded in 2018 uh, and kind of continued in an adjacent but related project called Black Swan, which is looking at decision-making mechanisms for artistic communities. And I'm going to share a bit about uh, what has worked and what hasn't worked in my experience, um, setting up a community that is very grounded in digital, but also has a physical space in Berlin. Um, and yeah, I just want to give some some substance for your planning and thinking about Chemnitz 2025. Um, so Trust is a physical space in Berlin and an online community of 300 people on a platform called Discord for multidisciplinary creative practitioners and researchers. And I'll shed a bit more light on who actually is making up this community. Um, and Black Swan is a collective researching and experimenting with collective decision-making mechanisms for creative communities. The kind of overarching motto of trust or our ambition is to create space for shared infrastructures and imaginaries. So trying to tie imagination to infrastructure and seeing infrastructure as something that can be shared from a locality or from a specific context beyond that context. So making, um, the needs of our community uh, and the way that we address them somehow useful to other people is really important to what we do. And I, I tried to very concretely address the brief of this discussion today and trying to think about what, what doesn't work from or what hasn't worked in my experience to what works. And so I think just to start things off before I get into it, um, I wanted to go over a bit what works um, as an overview and then at the end return to this after, um, after I share a bit more about the work that I've been doing. So in terms of what works, it, communities need full-time management. Um, I think there's an idea, and I, I had this idea also that you, you set up a place for people to have a conversation or you set up a space and people will just do things, but this is a complete fallacy for my experience. It's completely false that people will just start doing things. There needs to be enough structure in place and enough maintenance, um, even just somebody making sure that the floors are kept clean and um, this type of work also translates into a digital space. So. Um, I'll, I'll share a bit about how we have been thinking about community management, but in the work that we've done with different um, cultural institutions as like consultants, it's, I think this is a misunderstood uh, thing that communities need people to, to take on the structural role so that they can just do things. Um, then related to this is being very specific about who is involved in your community, who are you targeting, um, who are the participants. This is echoing the, the previous speaker who summarized it in a really beautiful way, but um, 
yeah, just being really specific about who you want to involve um, and actually how you can support the things that they're already doing. Um, we also developed participatory media formats. So um, going beyond a broadcast approach to communication, really thinking about how you engage um, people in conversations. Then there's standing on the shoulder of giants, which is trying to contribute to, to shared infrastructures. And I'm talking very concretely about digital infrastructures, but um, with open source, you can use both existing things that have already been developed and contribute back to this. So the work that a cultural project does and a publicly funded cultural project can actually contribute back to, to a much wider digital context. And I think that that's something that's very exciting. Um, also echo echoing the other speaker is the importance of experimentation, prototyping and iteration. So like in our project, we, we do a lot of working groups, we do a lot of role playing activities before we implement any finalized program. And we try and keep things very flexible, malleable and open to discussion and for people to take it in different directions. Um, and and yeah, just to highlight this idea of accessibility, which I think is really important. So um, thinking about a range of, of people and abilities, whether this is about vision impairment when we're designing websites or um, just thinking about how all of the design decisions we make in a community or in a, a digital platform are really important for people with different um, different abilities and who are coming from different places. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about the the way that we built a community. And I know it's it's three hundred people. It's not three hundred thousand or um, the ambitions, but maybe there's there's something to learn about um, the process and ways of of opening up a physical location and building a hybrid community. Um, so we were able to get a space in Berlin that was already a shared workspace. So the rent was kind of covered by uh, people renting desks there. And we started organizing public events and lectures on topics that we felt weren't well represented by the, the cultural programming in Berlin and Europe more widely. Um, and from the beginning, all of our events were opened to a online audience. So we kind of turned our physical location into a broadcasting studio. Um, and I think that this is an interesting approach for thinking about a hybrid community is how can you turn the hybrid nature of it into part of the, the scenography or make that visible, not needing to hide everything away or um, construct very separate things, but how can we actually reflect the digital and the physical space and reflect the physical space in the digital space. Um, and from doing these presentations, we developed online, uh, a collection of online videos on, on different um, topics. And we were very intentional on making sure that everything would be uh, recorded and distributed online and we use twitch which is a, a live streaming platform more associated with video game communities but um increasingly has more uh discussion formats i i'll talk about this a bit but um the choice of platform also becomes very important and it codes certain forms of interaction it it affords different types of participation and so um, being clear about who is in the community and who you want to involve. Um, we for trust produced some kind of loose user profiles based around the people who were already um, coming to our events and the the things that they um, were interested in. And so I think really echoing what the previous speaker was saying, um, the more conversations you can have with communities and like de-universalizing this idea of the public to think about how 
there are all of these different social groups already existing in a space or already existing around maker spaces and thinking about what new types of making might not currently be supported by the makerspace infrastructure um, what what is a process that could shed light on unmet need and how could then chemnitz be supporting this this need um, of different creative communities seems like an exciting approach so i know that uh, my experiences is 300 people so working with 300,000 seems like a completely different thing, but I feel like nesting the groups and, and thinking about how you can build a network of different um, disciplines, different practices um, would be a really exciting way of approaching the community. And I think also lends itself more towards a translocal or, or opening up the local to to participation across borders. Um, it, we also built physical infrastructure. So this is a project called the Cybernetics Library, which we host in Berlin. And they also have um, a branch in New York, but it's kind of the opposite of a lending library where the people around trust check their books in so it becomes um, an archive of the varied interests of the group of people who revolve around trust. And so it's really nice to see the books that have been um, lent to this library um, and become a, a resource for everybody to, to use and learn from. Um, and we have an online catalog as well on our website, um, library.trust.support, where you can see the list of all the books and who they belong to. Um, Trust also very early on started doing residencies to open up participation in the space and make it more accessible. Um, and I think uh, following on this idea of layering like levels of participation. So not everybody is going to want to do a residency. Not everyone is going to want to give a talk, but um, having having the ability for people who want to be more involved to be in, involved at a more intimate level um, really helps give the community substance and makes it i think a more authentic space for people because um, everybody is contributing something to building it and it's open for people to take it in different directions um, and with the residencies that we did they were organized loosely around different themes that um, the people at Trust discussed and uh, wanted to make the, the residency topic for a four month period. And, um, and the outputs were always online events or like physical digital events. So we, they would present the research that they had done at the end of the residency in an event um, that was live streamed and would contribute to our archive of, of videos online. Um, these are some so you have a few things. minutes left, sorry, just two, so three minutes left. That's helpful. <laughs> um, so we use Discord um, and yeah, as I was saying before, it's very managed. Um, we collaborate with somebody called Joanna Pope who does um, a Discord based reading group. And we found that actually visual material isn't needed. There's a kind of zoom fatigue now and just doing voice and um, text communication has worked really effectively um, we do a show and tell format also uh, similarly where we feature a different member of the community every week who shares what they're working on what they're thinking on and uh, basically hosts a discussion around it um, we experiment with different participatory live stream formats on Twitch. We play games together um, on Twitch. And I wanted to talk a bit about some of the open source projects and institutional partnerships that we've done because um, it ties into this idea of building a shared code base or standing on the shoulder of giants, not needing to reinvent the wheel 
but um, thinking about what what tools or what infrastructures already exists and could be contributed to. Um, so this was a project we did with HKV, um, building an online social space for exhibitions and events, which we've since um, turned into an open source project and collaborated with iBeam, which is a media arts institution in New York, um, amongst others in contributing to this shared events platform um, and code base. And then finally and quickly, I'll talk a bit about moving towards um, community governance and decision making. So there was a need or there was a desire to not have decisions made in a in a very top down way, but allow for um, participants to to decide how resources are distributed, um, how opportunities are given to different people and trust has an adjacent project researching specifically this called black swan which i'm involved in um, and we used a very iterative and experimental process to try and understand what felt right to the community we wanted to um, use play and use experimentation to um, prototype um, decision-making tools and voting mechanisms that uh, didn't impose ways of interaction or wouldn't um, put people off participating. So we invited nine different members to be part of a working group. Uh, we paid them for taking part and we used the Discord to uh, test three different voting mechanics. Um, we ended up with 16 proposals. We weren't even sure what people would want to do um, in this community of 300 people. We offered grants of only 300 euros, but um, it seemed like for 300 euros, people were very happy to try a new collaboration. They, they were more interested in networking, um, building new, new collaborative projects, um, Whereas more money, a, a larger grant would obviously have different affordances and maybe would be more for uh, an existing project or um, an existing collaboration, whereas smaller, a smaller grant seems to allow people to take risks and do things that they wouldn't necessarily do with more money. Um, I can share links to talks that we've given on this project if you're interested in um, finding out more about it. But I think interesting for you maybe is um, just a bit about the findings that we had from this community governance experiment, which was that people more valued the weekly meeting. We met every single Monday at 1 p.m. and having this regular time to meet um, than the voting tool that we were using. So actually just having a town meeting that's facilitated and that gives people a purpose to, to show up and be there and share um, seemed to be the thing that was most valuable to people, which, is re which was really interesting and surprising to us. Um, there's a lot of findings. We, wanted, we did conversations and interviews. We wanted to really understand how the different parts of this process felt and worked um but yeah i'll stop there um it's a lot i can share links that goes deeper into some of the things i've touched on um but i think my my main points around what works is that community management is a full-time thing um and it's really important to understand the nuances of the people that you're trying to include um, and to think about different tiers of participation so that some people can have a, a more intimate uh, relationship to organizing, whereas other people can can listen and learn and hear. Um, and yeah, I think this uh, experimental and iterative development process that is constantly engaging with, with these communities um, has worked really well for us and something that we're gonna keep, keep pursuing in the future.